Ja, wir kommen zurück zu unserem kleinen Online-Vortrag für heute. In den letzten Videos haben wir uns damit befasst, was Farben für eine Rolle spielen im Ozean und im Wasser. Und Farbe ist natürlich abhängig auch vom Licht. Und daher haben wir uns überlegt, dass wir heute uns äh, ja, mit dem Licht als Faktor beschäftigen und wie sich das Ganze auswirkt auf, ja, auf das Leben im Ozean. Wenn ihr noch ein bisschen mehr zu den Farben mehr im Allgemeinen wissen wollt, dann schaut euch doch auch mal unser Video zu Warum ist das Wasser blau und vor allem unser Frag den Experten ähm, Interview von letzter Woche mit Johannes an. Genau. After introducing you to the general topic of colors and the water in our last videos, we will now speak about light and its influence on the organisms in the ocean. Because the light or visible light is only a part within the electromagnetic spectrum and it's that part that can be perceived by the human eye. The overall electromagnetic spectrum is also including radio waves, microwaves, infrared radiation, X-rays and gamma rays. The energy of these wavelengths is decreasing with their lengths and short wavelengths are therefore more energetic than long wavelengths. The visible light is usually defined as the wavelength between 400 and 700 nanometers. So between the ultraviolet light with shorter wavelength and the infrared light with longer wavelength. If you want to know more about these wavelengths and the resulting colors of and in the oceans, you should also check our latest videos on colors in the ocean and why is the ocean blue. In this video, we will only focus on the so-called photosynthetic active radiation. To the wavelengths between 400 and 700 nanometers. But in future videos, we will also cover the UV light, the shorter wavelength between 280 and 400 nanometers, and its influence on organisms in the ocean, as well as how marine animals can produce light themselves. But first, it makes sense to understand where in the ocean the organisms receive light and can therefore use it. The zones of the ocean are divided by their light conditions. The uppermost layer here is called the Euphotic Zone, ranging from the surface to a depth of about 200 meters. The actual extension of the zone is of course dependent on the properties of the respective water body and ocean. In turbid waters, it can be less deep than in very clear water. Photic refers hereby to the word photon, the scientific word for the light particle. So literally speaking, the tiniest parts that the electromagnetic radiation is made of. Here in the euphotic zone, we can find the highest level of bioproductivity and the highest diversity within the ecosystem ocean. We can find most of the plankton, mostly tiny organisms that, according to the definition, cannot swim against the currents but are drifted by them, but also the classical nectar organisms can be found here. Fishes, marine mammals, crustaceans, and cephalopods such as fish. The euphotic zone is also where you find the seagrass meadows, kelp and other macroalgae, and in tropical oceans, the coral reefs. The fact that this water layer is so sunlit is allowing the algae and higher plants that live here to conduct photosynthesis. Because light, together with water, is the main component for plants for their transformation into energy through photosynthesis. Its availability is therefore for all higher plants, like the seagrasses, but also the seaweeds and the unicellular algae as both free-living plankton or as symbionts, for example in corals, absolutely essential. Photosynthesis, that is the process in which water and carbon dioxide are transformed into glucose and oxygen under the influence of energy and under the help of chlorophyll. This process is the most fundamental process of energy production in all plants. During this process, the light energy is used by the chlorophyll molecules within the chloroplast to break up water molecules in a process that is also called photolysis. In a second step, carbon dioxide is then gradually reduced to glucose, which can be then used by the plants to build up starch. The produced oxygen is then released as waste and can be again consumed by organisms that require oxygen, such as as humans. This process of photosynthesis is the reason why all plants, but also all organisms that live in a symbiosis with plants, need light to live. Light efficiency can thus also lead to a reduction of photosynthesis, meaning if there's not enough light, for example, in the deeper layers of the euphotic zone, phototrop organisms might have problems as they receive too little light. That means in order to be able to live here, they had to adapt to these low light conditions. 
Red algae, for example, solve this problem by using, in addition to their chlorophyll, so-called accessory pigments. The different forms of chlorophyll mostly use the wavelength of light between 400 and 500 nanometers, and then again between 600 and 700 nanometers. The fact that they absorb almost no light in the wavelength between, which is the green part of the spectrum, is all the reason why most plants appear green. Red algae now use, in addition to the chlorophyll, these accessory pigments, for example, phytoerythrin, which can be found in quite high levels within their chloroplasts. And that is because phytoerythrin now can absorb and thus use some of the wavelength that the chlorophyll is not using. This increases the efficiency of the photosystems in these algae and they are able to make most out of the reduced light energy that they receive in these deeper depths. But also too much light can lead to problems because it can cause photoinhibition and photooxidation. Normally, plants have a number of defense mechanisms to deal with these high light levels and are, at least to a certain point, able to protect themselves. At a certain point, however, also light stress can become lethal. On that regard, especially the highly energetic UV radiation can be problematic. That is why many organisms have to evolve photoprotective mechanisms against these short wavelengths. But as I mentioned before, this is another very complex topic that we will speak about in more detail in one of our next videos. That is also why, in addition to high surface water temperatures, also light stress can lead to the so-called coral bleaching, where corals expel their symbiotic algae under stressful conditions as they start to produce compounds that are harmful for the coral host. But even fish have to be shown to be affected. A study from Australia, for example, reports that fish can get lesions and dark spots when they're exposed to high irradiances. So they basically get skin cancer just as we do lose. Below the euphotic zone, we find the dysphotic or twilight zone. Depending on the turbidity of the water, it can start as shallow as at a depth of about one meter. But usually the twilight zone extends between 200 and about 1000 meter water depth. Due to the low light conditions here, photosynthesis is not possible anymore, so we won't find any plants, neither as plankton or macroalgae or higher plants such as sea grasses. However, there is still enough remaining blue light available that some animals can use it for the so-called phototaxis, meaning they can still see it and use it for some level of orientation. Animals in the dysphotic zones can't feed on phytoplankton or other plant-based food anymore, so they are either carnivore, meaning they are eating other animals, or dead to war, feeding on dead organic material, the so-called marine snow. Within the twilight zone, we can also find many organisms that use bioluminescence, so they can produce light themselves. I told you before that this itself is a very complex process, and we will dedicate an own video on this topic. But let's speak about some of these organisms that we can find. Down here, you can find, for example, the deep sea hatchet fishes. These weird-looking inhabitants of the twilight zone can be usually found in depth between 200 and 600 meters, and they are very well adapted to the life of these dark waters. Their large, sometimes tube-shaped eyes can collect the faintest of light and focus well on objects both close and far. In many genera, the eyes are fixed, gazing permanently upwards, enabling them to discern the silhouettes of prey moving overhead against the slightly brighter upper water. On their dorsal side, they also possess so-called light organs or photophores that these fish use as an active camouflage to disguise themselves. This is called counter-illumination or counter-light. How this works, you might ask? Well, let's have a closer look. Imagine you're a bigger fish swimming below a hatchet fish. You will be able to see its silhouette against the slightly lighter background of the surface waters. However, by turning on this counter-illumination, the fish is able to almost disappear. The intensity of the light produced is controlled by the fish, and the appropriate brightness is chosen according to how much light reaches the eyes from above. The patterns of light that are recreated by the photophores are also unique to each species and probably also play a role in culture. But there are also other pretty creepy looking fishes down here in the dysphotic zone. For example, the barbell dragonfish. They're quite small, usually around 15 centimeters up to 26 centimeters, are apex predators and have enormous jaws filled with fang like teeth. These dragonfishes also possess a luminous spherical organ that hangs off the lower jaw as a thin barbel. 
through bioluminescence, they can make the end of this bubble glow, which they can then use to attract prey with. So it's basically just like a fishing rod. Along both the dorsal and ventral side of its body, these fish also possess single strips of chevron-shaped spots of luminescent tissue that, when stimulated, appears to glow either yellow or blue-green. Within the group of these marble dragonfishes, there's also one that is definitely worth having a closer look. This is Malacosteus nida, also known by the common names Northern Stoplight Loose Jaw or Lightless Loose Jaw. Malacosteus and some other related genera are the only fishes that can produce red bioluminescence. As most of their prey organisms are not capable of perceiving light at those wavelengths, this allows Malacosteus to hunt with an essentially invisible beam of light. It is not yet fully clear how this works in detail, but here's what we know for now. Malacosteus can see its prey with the help of red light, without being able to be seen itself and without attracting other predatory fish. So this basically works like night vision goals. Its photocells initially produce blue-green light, which is absorbed again by pigments and reaches a filter with about 626 nanometers, so as light within the yellow part of the spectrum. There it is filtered again and finally sent to the sea at 705 nanometers, so as red light. Unlike us, Malacosteus now has no visual pigments that are sensitive to red light. So he cannot see the light he emits to illuminate the dike itself and therefore needs a filter. The red light is initially absorbed by a special antenna pigment and then sent to the visual cells in the form of energy. There, the visual pigments sensitive to blue and green light can pass on the information to the brain. In fact, the antenna pigment is even similar to that of chlorophyll in green plants and like plant chlorophyll, it converts light into energy. Below the twilight zone, we find the ephotic zone. It usually starts at a depth of about 1,000 meters and no light reaches this depth. Did you know that about 54% of our oceans lay within this depth, meaning in everlasting night? Most of the animals found here spend their entire lives in this depth. In some of the animal species that are living here, the light sense organs are therefore strongly or even completely reduced, so that it means they're blind. But surprisingly, we can still discover a lot of life down here, and even groups that we otherwise only know from the light flooded surface waters, such as the forest, for example. Here in the deep sea, there are also reefs formed by deep sea or cold water corals. Cold water corals, because here, it is, and it's true for almost all seas, it is consistently cold with temperatures uh, that are close to zero degrees Celsius. By the way, unlike their relatives on the surface, the corals down here do not live in a symbiosis with unicellular algae and can survive without one. Due to the lack of these algae, we can only see the transparent polyps in their white limestone skeleton. For example, here in the reef building and best known species, Sophilia petrifera. Since these corals cannot get the additional energy of their algae symbionts, they depend on catching their food themselves from the water column, and that is why they all grow much slower than their shallow water column. By the way, almost half of all coral species are such deep and cold water corals. And since we have reached these deep sea reefs now, we're also at the bottom of the deep sea, deep in the aquatic zone where there's no light anymore and it's pitch black. But still, life can include light down here. Because in 1985, a PhD student of the MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute found a light-sensitive organ at special shrimp species that live at the black smokers of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. If this photoreceptor would indeed be some kind of primitive eye, then what do these shrimps see in a depth of about 3,600 meters where there's actually no light? So Rimicarus extrapolata has no normal eyes. That is also why it's got the name Exopolata, which basically means without eyes. And that is not surprising, given that it's living in these pitch black depths. However, when the scientists investigated its anatomy, they found a big reflecting organ on the dorsal side of the shrimp, underneath its chest plate. This organ is not producing real pictures, but is a very sensitive photoreceptor, and it can absorb light at about 500 nanometers, so in the blue-green energetic part of the spectrum. But what kind of light do these shrimps see and where is it coming from? In order to understand this, we need to remember where these shrimps live. Their home are the so-called black smokers, hyperthermal vents at the bottom of the ditch. 
the most possible light source down here is actually the heat radiation or the liquids that comes out of the smokers because they can reach extremely high temperatures of over 350 degrees Celsius. Heat or thermal radiation is the light emitted by a hot object. So the same phenomenon that you can see in a heating element or the burner of an electric oven. In 1988, scientists were able to take a photo of such a black smoker without external light source and indeed, their photo showed that there was a light limb coming from the external openings of these smokers. Since then, many scientists are studying this phenomena to understand the mechanisms of the light, what it can tell us about the black smokers themselves, and also how organisms down here are reacting to this light source. Until now, it is not really clear why and how animals such as Vimicarus and Sucolata have evolved such structures to light. To be fair, it is not even 100% sure yet that they actually use these structures in the way that scientists assume and what they would do with the received information. For example, would they use this photoreceptor to see the external opening to find food or rather to avoid them in order not to be cooked alive by the fluids that are coming out of the smoke? And I don't know how you feel about it, but here's my last and kind of nerdy words on this. Because whenever I think, speak, or hear of this light in the deep sea, I have to think of the Lord of the Rings and Galadriel, which either in the first book or film, whatever you prefer, give the light of Erendil to Frodo and says, it's made be a light to you in dark places when all other lights go out. Ja, wir hoffen, es hat euch gefallen. Wenn dem so ist, dann lasst gerne ein Like oder ein Abo da. Äh, viel cooler ist es natürlich, Meeresbiologie direkt vor Ort zu erfahren und Schnorchel zu gehen und sich das Ganze vor Ort anzuschauen. Das ist nach wie vor natürlich sehr eingeschränkt möglich und die Menschen, die das normalerweise äh, zur Verfügung stellen und durchführen, die leiden natürlich nach wie vor auch sehr stark unter den ganzen Einschränkungen. Und um das weiterhin zu erhalten, schaut euch auch einfach gerne mal die ähm, GoFundMe-Aktionen an, die wir verlinkt haben und unterstützt die, wie ihr könnt und wollt. Genau, damit es auch in Zukunft dann die Möglichkeiten noch gibt und wieder gibt, Meeresbiologie zum Anfassen auch vor Ort zu erleben. Bis nächstes Mal. Tschüss.